It's been said that America was the first country to be founded not by a shared history or ethnicity, but on a shared idea. In a time when our politics are as divided as at any point since the Civil War, that shared idea of the American dream may be the last thing that we can agree on. In touring America in search of what made it exceptional, Alexis de Tocqueville called it the charm of anticipated success. And yet, today, that charm is starting to fade. At one point in our history, we were the place where that opportunity happened, unlike anywhere else. Millions of immigrants came to our shores because opportunity was shared more broadly than anywhere else. In 1931, James Truslow Adams coined the term the American dream. And even though at the time he recognized that there was never an American dream that was truly accessible for all, he did believe that at the time we were doing it better than anywhere else. Talent, as they say, is everywhere, but opportunity is not. At one time, we were better at sharing that opportunity as broadly as possible. Yet today, in the Scandinavian countries, in the European Union, in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, even Canada are better places to pursue the American dream than right here in America. The socioeconomic status of a child's parents are one of the strongest predictors of their readiness for kindergarten. Yet inequality starts to develop before they're even born. A mother in poverty and experiencing stress and unable to get healthy food impacts the brain development of their child. This is not sustainable for America. Research on why nations rise and fall shows that when inclusive political institutions where everyone has a voice and inclusive economic institutions where everyone has a chance lead those countries to grow, and yet, if those with economic power are able to reform the political institutions to entrench their power, no longer are they able to continue to grow and instead it becomes a vicious cycle where that power continues to be entrenched further and further. I had the opportunity a few years ago to fulfill a childhood dream and go to ancient Athens, the site of the first democracy. And I was struck by the fact that the democracy, as well as its buildings, were no longer being maintained, but only managed for a slow decline. Contrast that with the United States Capitol, which has continuously grown and changed and evolved since it was built. When it was built, there was no electricity, and today there's hundreds of thousands of light fixtures, thousands of miles of wiring for those lights, not to mention cable and internet. The Founding Fathers never could have foreseen the internet and all the things that were necessary. You see, there's two things that need to be true for you to ever stop evolving. One, that you have it all figured out, and two, that everything around you stops changing. So pretty much never. The Founding Fathers were humble enough to know that in addition to a capital building that needed to evolve, our Constitution needed to evolve as well. And so in addition to a system for amendments, they recognized that they would not be perfect, but that their intention was only to create a more perfect union. That They recognized that things would continue to change and the needs would continue to change, and they hoped only to make progress. So if evolution is necessary for lasting success, why do we resist it? Well, it turns out that as group size grows and people start to specialize in different tasks and, and hierarchies develop, those in power have a tendency to try to maintain what they already have. In other words, rather than continuing to build, they start digging moats. Now, this moat digging, once you start, it becomes very hard to stop because as inequality increases, those in power have both more incentive and more resources to continue digging that moat and protecting what they already have. Yet this hurts all of us collectively. It turns out that in both business and in sports, those teams that have more inequality in their payrolls end up having less cooperation and performing at lower levels. 
Additionally, in nature, the edge effect proves that when ecosystems overlap, it's at that overlap that there's the most innovation and the most creativity. This happens in human systems where people that are bilingual or have traveled to different countries end up being more creative than they otherwise would have been. Additionally, scientists who come from more ethnically diverse labs end up having papers that are more widely cited and more influential. So this actually ends up hurting all of us collectively. Additionally, once you've actually finished digging your moat and you're surrounded, you've actually boxed yourself in from any further growth. It's a good thing that in the US capital was not surrounded by a moat because as the United States continued to grow and evolve, they added states, they added legislators, and they had to add to the north and south wings of the capital building. But it turns out that this is not just bad for us collectively, but moat digging actually hurts those who built the moat themselves. In medieval times, often rather than trying to storm the castle, those that were trying to take over would instead surround the castle, starving those inside. They were, unable to, they were unable to grow and they were unable to access resources. And so those that had built the moat for their protection ended up sealing their own fate. But this happens not just in national politics or medieval castles. It happens in business too. Oftentimes, when businesses start to grow and they get deep pockets, rather than continuing to try to out-innovate their competitors, they instead decide to start to spend money trying to lobby to extend patents or to avoid taxation or regulation. Imagine what might have happened if the taxi industry, rather than trying to dig a moat and protect themselves against ride sharing, had spent just a fraction of that amount of money to build an app of their own. This moat digging ends up hurting us, all of us collectively, even those at the top even those that started digging the moat themselves. And yet, digging a moat does not make you evil. In fact, it's something that we all tend to do when we have something to protect. When Apple first started, they were accused of stealing intellectual property from Xerox. And Steve Jobs quoted Pablo Picasso famously saying, good artists copy, but great artists steal. And yet, 14 years later, when Apple was no longer the upstart rebel storming the castle, but instead was the king of their own castle, they accused Android of stealing their intellectual property. And Steve Jobs said that he was willing to go thermonuclear war to defend it. Now, clearly, his view on moats had changed. But not only had they started to try to dig moats against competitors, they had also started to try to dig moats and funneled less and less of their money towards continuing to innovate and more and more on regulations, avoiding taxation. Even though much of the innovation that led to their products was funded by government-funded research, from GPS to touchscreens to microprocessors and the internet. So why do we have this reflexive distaste for regulation? and taxation. Well, it, we often celebrate Adam Smith and his celebration of, of free markets that, that undergird our capitalist system. And yet, if we look at evolution, we see that our bodies are constantly regulating us to keep us alive. That regulation of our temperatures and countless other processes are going on at any given time. Further, our circulatory system continues to cycle nutrients throughout our bodies. Yet at a time where the top 1% have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 90, it's as if all of our blood and nutrients are in our big toe and the rest of our body is starving. Now, if you truly look at what Adam Smith said, they looked at ec economics and saw that there was two ways to make money in economics. Either you build something, you innovate, you create something new, or you start to leverage what already exists, moat digging. Economists, though, they call that rent-seeking. And it turns out that when Adam Smith talked of free markets, 
He was talking of markets not free from regulation, but free from rent-seeking. So if we hope to avoid the fall of America, like so many great nations before, from extractive political and extractive economic institutions, we need radical change. And yet, if you look at the word radical, it comes from the Latin, meaning root. And it turns out that at the root of the American dream was a shared prosperity and shared opportunity for as many people as possible. And to have radical change for capitalism would return to Adam Smith's root intention for markets not free from regulation, but free from rent-seeking and moat-digging. It's time for a radical evolution towards more inclusive prosperity for all. Thank you.